John 6, and we're going to look at verses 60 through 71. Now, this has been a very tough chapter and a very tough experience for Jesus because he has a crowd that's unruly. He has a crowd that's complaining. He has a crowd of many who do not believe in him, and they're complaining. They're upset with him. They don't like what he's had to say. Now, many times when people read the Gospels, they always think that the followers of Christ were all just fawning over him and just completely in love with him, and that is just not the case. And this chapter is the perfect example of that experience. So there were times and crowds that they didn't like what Jesus had to say. Now, Jesus has corrected these people because after he, he fed the 5,000 and with the bread and fish that were multiplied, he then corrected them because they were seeking him for the wrong reason. And, you know, nobody likes to get corrected, but that was the beginning. He had to correct them. He said, you're not, you don't have the right motive for why you are seeking me. And so with that, he began to explain what did they really need. They needed to come to him. They needed to come and eat of, as he says here, and, and we looked at it in our last study, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, that was a radical statement for Jesus to make. And these people, they listened to that and they said, we don't like that. We don't want to hear that. This is offensive to us. And so Jesus explained to them, look, this is a spiritual thing. It's just, I'm talking about spiritual things. This is a basically figurative language. It's a metaphor. You have to come to me and you have to receive me just like you do food. Just like you ate of the manna that was given to the children of Israel in the wilderness, you need to partake of me. You need to receive me within you. And then I will begin to change your life. And how did they respond? Well, notice verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Now, the words hard saying literally mean that this was a demanding request or an offensive request or an intolerable request. So they're standing there just going, hold it back up, this, we're not into this. This is their response. And then verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you shall, should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe, referring to their willful decision to not believe in him. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back, or literally went away, and walked with him no more. So they said, we're done with you, Jesus. Verse 67, then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. 
So what I want to talk to you about this morning is why people reject the Lord. This is a classic passage of Scripture that deals with this subject. And it deals with it, I think, very effectively. It basically hits all of the high points of this issue that you want to you wanna understand. So why do people reject Him? Why do people reject Christ? You are going to share the gospel with people and they are going to reject your message. And the reason why they reject your message is the same reason why these individuals were rejecting the message of Christ. And so you have to understand this. I think that if you take this subject and you just simplify it down, you can, you can get a better grasp of it. And that is, it's a very simple answer. People either are self-seeking or they are God-seeking. That's it. That's the only two options that you have. Let me show you this in the scripture. In Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Paul teaches that God will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek what? Seek for glory, honor, and immortality. And God is the only one who has glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath so basically Paul just says look you got two options two groups of people one person is seeking self they're self-seeking and the, another person is seeking God so it's seek yourself your own way your own ideas your own concepts or you're going to seek God and what he has said what he teaches and his truth so those are the only two options. Now, when you read the Gospels, you come to the conclusion that Jesus would never allow people to remain neutral. He would never allow them to stay in a place of indecision because he told them very clearly, if you're not with me, you are against me. Matthew 12, 30. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. So Jesus made that statement over and over again in many different ways and different forms. He said, you either trust in mammon or you trust in God. Those are your only options, self-seeking or God-seeking. And so this simplifies it all down. It's all according to what I want, what I believe, what I think, what I want to do, or it's what he has declared, what he has commanded me to do, and his truth. Those are your two options. And so this is a, an issue that I think if you simplify it down to this reasoning, you get it, and you get it, and you can remember it so that you can point this out to individuals you speak to. Because when somebody rejects the Lord, you want to be able to determine why are they rejecting him. There's something that is causing them to reject him. So what is it so you can address that specific issue? Now, there are basically five simple issues and things that you need to look for when you're speaking to someone and they're rejecting the Lord. You want to ask them what they believe about God, the nature and the character of God. Do they believe God exists? If they believe God exists, what is God like? Because that's a whole area, a subject matter that you need to understand. And so, is God an exalted man or is God spirit? The Bible declares he is spirit and he's not an exalted man. You, you shouldn't see him as some man on a throne exalted in the heavens because that's not who he is. And so he is a spirit. The scripture says that the heavens of heaven cannot contain him, that the heavens are his tabernacle. I mean, this is our tabernacle, but the heavens 
25 billion light years in diameter are his tabernacle. That's where he dwells. So he's not going to conform himself to some little spot on some little throne somewhere in, in the universe. So it's really an important thing to understand who is God. The second issue is who is Jesus? And when you consider that subject, who is Jesus? Is he a man? Is he a prophet? Is he a great teacher? Or is he God come in human flesh? Which is he? So many times people stumble over the fact of who Jesus is. The third thing is sin. When people stumble and they want to reject the gospel, many times there is a specific sin. I don't want to stop this. So I'm not in. I am willing to repent of anything and everything in my life and obey his truth because I'm seeking glory and immortality. I'm seeking God. Then I'll do whatever he tells me to do. Righteousness is the fourth one. You see, sin is what I'm not supposed to do. Righteousness is what I am supposed to do what I'm called to do, what I'm commanded to do. And so people struggle in these areas. And then last is the issue of judgment. Many times, I mean, there was, there's a whole pseudo-Christian cult that started out of their leader saying, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe that there is judgment to come. And that's where the Jehovah Witnesses came from. And they, in addition, rejected who is Jesus. So when you, you look at every uh, other religious system, when you look at every uh, pseudo-Christian uh, group, they, they will always err in one of these issues. When you look at the issue of Hinduism, Hinduism, you can worship anything, whatever you want. Anything you want to worship, you can worship. And Jesus and his position as God, supreme over all, is rejected. When you look at Islam, the very same thing is true. Jesus is rejected as God in favor of the moon God, Allah. Now, this is the reason why on most flags of Muslim countries, you will see a little half moon or a little crescent moon, because that is the God that they are serving. Allah was one of the 360 gods that were in the Kaaba in the 6th century. And this is what the people, the Arabic people, worshipped in that day. And what Muhammad did was he just came in and he said, uh, I've had a revelation that Allah is the only true God and we're getting rid of all the rest of these gods. So they worship the moon god instead of the true and living god so it is a it's a very important thing if you look at as i mentioned jehovah witnesses they reject god they reject jesus as god and they reject the scriptures so they've translated their own scriptures they've changed the scripture to fit their own beliefs and then if you look at Mormonism, they do the same thing. They have rejected Jesus as God because they believe that you can become a God just like Adam was a God or any of their other leaders became gods. So why do people do that? Why do people change the scripture and change the, the, these fundamental belief issues that are clearly taught in the scripture? It's because of this. It's the same reason. It's self versus God. I don't like what I see, so I am going to change him into an image made like to me. You see, he's going to be a God that I make up. Have you ever heard people say to you, well, if I were God, I wouldn't do that. And I don't think that should happen. Or I don't think he should do that. And so what they've done is they've now, they're forming their own God after their own image. Now this is what Paul said would take place in those who reject the truth. 
in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 23. He says, those who reject the truth, he says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And what? They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man or birds, or four-footed beasts, and creeping things. So in other words, we make either God to be some exalted man that I think he should be, or I make him into an idol. Uh, you can go to India today, and you can see all manner of four-footed beasts and creeping things that are worshipped. And so it's, it's exactly as the Scripture declares. So this is is the fundamental reason why people reject him and turn from him. So you have to just remember this. Either you are changed by God or you will change God. You will change his word. You will change his truth. Again, I've seen this happen so many times with individuals that I have ministered to. Let me give you just one example. I shared with a guy here not too long ago, and he was struggling with smoking pot. And he said, you know, it's just, I, I just can't believe that God would not want me to get high. <laughs> and I said, well, I showed him all the scriptures. I said, this is, this is where the scripture teaches that he doesn't want you to get high. He wants you to have a relationship with him that will satisfy the reason why you're getting high. And he said, yes, yeah, so great, okay, yeah. And then I saw him a couple months later, didn't see him again for a while, and he, he said, well, I said, how, how's, how are you doing? And he said, well, you know, I, I've come to realize that God said all of the uh, herbs of the field are good and for food, and I think that God is okay with me getting high. And I said, well, first read the scripture. It says all these seed-bearing herbs are good for food, not smoke. And so there's a big difference there. But the issue is, is the individual changed God into his own image instead of yielding to what God declared. And so I either change and allow him to change me or... I change him, and I make him into my own image. And so is there any issue in your faith where you're <clears throat> refusing to be changed? Anything where you're saying, well, I just don't accept that verse of Scripture. I don't accept that particular issue. I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. We'll just put that over to the side here. If that's the case, you are in danger because... Sooner or later, you're going to have to make a decision. Remember, Jesus will not allow you to be neutral. You see, we think we can be indifferent, but indifference and a failure to decide is a decision. And it's a decision that's leading me down a particular path, and it's away from him. So yield that to him today. Now, what does Jesus attempt to do with these people that are rejecting him, that are saying, you are offensive, what you're saying is offensive, it's intolerable, I'm not going for it. What does Jesus do to him? Does he say, see you later? No. He said, what does he do? He seeks to determine what is offending them, and then he begins to persuade them. He's trying to encourage them to follow him. Notice how he does that. Verse 61 there at the end. He says, does this offend you? Does this stumble you, what I've said? And he wants them to, to respond and say, yes, this specific thing is what is stumbling me. That's why you have to understand those general areas that stumble people so that you can then minister to them. And then he says in verse 62, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? So if this stumbles you that I've told you, you have to partake of me, just like your fathers part partook of the 
manna, what are you going to do when you don't see me anymore? When I'm not right here, when I'm not doing what I'm doing right now, and that is talking to you face to face, what are you going to do then? Now, this is a, a great question because it, again, is another issue that people struggle with. When they don't hear from the Lord, when they don't feel something, they don't get that little tingle down their back that they had in their last service, and, or maybe the Lord is asking them to turn from something and they're fighting with Him, then all of a sudden there's a problem. And that is what turns that individual and their thinking away from the Lord. And so it is essential that you determine, you know, am I, am I just a fair-weathered Christian? Am I just somebody who, who serves when everything is good? But what am I going to do when I don't feel anything, when I don't see what he's doing? He doesn't seem to be answering my prayers. What am I going to do then? You see, that's the question that you have to answer. What are you going to do then? Are you going to be, are you going to say, Lord, show me what it is? What am I doing? What is stumbling me? Because he'll show you exactly what it is. If you are not experiencing any real life inside, I mean, your Christian life is just kind of really just ho-hum. You need to find out why. Because Jesus said, I came to give you life, and that more abundantly. So if I'm not experiencing life, there is a reason why I'm not experiencing life. What is it? Determine what that is and deal with it because he wants to bring life, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That is what he desires to do. Now, their struggle was with this past statement that he had made. He told them, you have to eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. And this bothered them. They just said, this is intolerable. We can't, we can't go this far. Completely misunderstanding what he was saying. This is why Jesus said in verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. In other words, he's saying, I'm not talking about physically, fleshly eating my body. And then he says it plainly again. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So I'm talking about spiritual things because spiritual things are what brings life to you. So nothing in the physical will ever bring life. Nothing in the physical realm can give you the life that he promises. A relationship with someone, uh, some possession, some position, some power, some pleasure, those physical things cannot and can never satisfy the deepest spiritual need that a person has inside. Nothing. Nothing in the physical. So do you believe that? Do you believe nothing in the physical realm can ever truly satisfy you? If you do, if you believe that, then you need to be pursuing the Spirit and the Spirit of God. Because, he said, it is the Spirit who gives life. And the words that I speak to you are Spirit. They're spiritually motivated, They're, they will spiritually motivate you and they will bring you to a place of life. Jesus said this in John 5, 24. He said, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but is passed from death into life. So there's the statement. A simple statement. You've got to hear my word and believe in him who sent me. And if you do that, you will pass from death to life. You will come alive. So have you done that? Have you heard his word and obeyed it and then followed him? Because that's where the Spirit wants to lead you. 
So no practical, physical right, some religious right. That's, that's also something that cannot save you, cannot give you life. It says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There is no work in the physical realm that can save me. And so if they actually ate his flesh and drank his blood, that's not going to save them. If, they, if those that interpret this as being salvation through communion, they, Jesus is directly contradicting this. Taking some particular religious rite in communion cannot save someone because it's in the physical realm. I need to put my faith in him because I have heard him and asserted that I believe what he has declared. Now, this particular hard teaching was declared by his disciples. I want you to note something here. Very important to recognize. Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this. And then notice in verse 67, then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? So the disciples that are referred to in the uh, verse 61 are referring to his disciples in general, those that were following him and had been following him. The reason why he's not talking about the 12 is because now then he addresses the 12 specifically. Now, were they kind of probably talking among themselves, going, what's he talking about? Eating my flesh, drinking my blood. I'll bet they were. But he's talking the people that are the general followers are the ones that he is referring to, that John is referring to as his disciples. And so this is an essential thing to see. These are the, the individuals who are struggling. Now, notice that Jesus restates to them again why they do not believe. Now, this is important. This is the third time Jesus has made this same statement just a little different, but he says the same thing to them. He knows that there are people who don't believe in him. He knows that there are people who are offended by him and what he has said. And then he says, verse 65, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. No one. No one can come to me. So why is Jesus saying this again to them? Because he's restating his point. He's not changing his message. He is just restating his message and saying to them, look, if you truly want to follow me, if you have any inkling of faith within you, you've got to recognize that I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. I'm the author and the finisher of everything in your life. I'm the one who has pursued you. This is why God sent his son, because the gap between man and God is too great of a gap. There isn't anything in the physical realm I can do to bridge that gap. It is only Christ. Billy Graham in his Four Spiritual Laws has probably one of the best illustrations of this. There are two cliffs there is a great gulf fixed between the two. And there is no way for man to get to God. No way. So God came to man. He came to this earth. And the cross is the bridge over which man can come to know, Jesus, to know God and to know Christ, his son. And so Jesus here is just declaring again to them, Salvation begins with a sovereign act of God. He is the one who initiates. God initiates all of our salvation. He is the one who pursued you. He pursued me. I could have cared less. And there is no way for me to have found him. He found me. 
And so Jesus is making that absolutely clear here. But men respond. Must, men must respond. That is why in John 6.64 here, Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. So he's placing, again, the responsibility upon men to, that choose not to believe. So Jesus is teaching sovereignty, the sovereignty of God and he, in salvation, and he's teaching that man must respond. And then he puts one more little item in here. He says, it's all because of my foreknowledge. I know it all. So God is the initiator, man is the responder, and he knows how everyone is going to respond. That's why he says here in this text, knowing, knowing in himself who would believe and who would not believe and who would betray him. So this is pretty clear. He knows exactly who is who. He knows every single thing about me. He knows every detail in my mind. I cannot hide one thing from him. So let me show you this in another passage. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Peter here speaks about the elect, those that God has chosen. He says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience. So there are three very critical points that are essential to understand. So he is the one who has the foreknowledge, and he reaches forth to me. And I respond, and that is where the sanctification of the Holy Spirit takes place. You see, only that sanctification of the Spirit takes place in a person who believes. You have to believe to be saved. So John here is laying out for us the reason why people do not believe and why they turn away from the Lord. So last here in verses 67 through 71, why does Jesus challenge the 12? Why does he do that? Why does he challenge them? Because obviously he knows them. He knows they're probably struggling with some of the things that he has said as well. But he challenges them because they have a potential here of falling themselves. Now, for those of you that maybe are ultra Calvinists and you say, well, that's not a real possibility for anyone, that's not what the scripture teaches. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it says very clearly, Paul said, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There isn't a warning about falling given to believers unless that's a real potential. And that is why I believe Jesus is challenging them. He's challenging their faith. He challenged first the people who did not believe in him to try and persuade them. Now he's challenging his own disciples, the twelve, challenging them to believe and to commit to make a decision. In Second Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, there Peter says, Beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Now, what's the error of the wicked? The error of the wicked is simply, I can do what I please and I will be okay. And so he's warning these false teachers and the people who are following them throughout this entire epistle, you cannot live in sin and expect that everything is going to be fine. There are consequences. So he's warning them here these, in these last few words, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the only solution and the only way to keep a person from falling back into their old ways, going back to their old default, is growing. So you've got to grow. If you want to stand, then you have to grow. 
Again, there is no <laughs> middle ground. There's no neutral spot. I can just sit here and coast. A person who is coasting is slowing down. Turn the engine off of your car. You're coasting. Everything is fine. You're still going forward, right? But you're slowing down, and you don't even realize it. And so there is no place, no neutral place. It's grow or you will fall. That is what the Scripture encourages. All of Second Peter is given over to that message. Second Peter chapter 1, the whole chapter is given over to the exhortation to grow and to mature. And so God allows this whole situation as a good test for His own disciples. So, how about you? Would you respond as Peter responded here? No, Lord, we are, where can we go? There's no other option for us. There's no other place we can go. You're the only one who has the words of eternal life. So is that the way you would respond? I hope so. Do you have any other options available for you? For me, there is no other option. It's only Jesus. There is no other solution. There is no way I've tried them all. Most of you have tried them all. There is no life to be found there. You have to follow Him with your whole heart. Now last here, one last thing that I think is very important is this statement about Judas. Jesus said in verse 70, He said, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Now some people read this and they say, Well, chose him? Why would he choose him? Why would he choose him if he has foreknowledge and knows he's going to depart from him? He's going to betray him. So why would he do that? That just seems so cockeyed. That seems so crazy. Why would anybody do such a thing? And yet, I think it reveals the true love of God. It tr reveals the opportunity that God gives to every single man. And this is what God gives to this man, Judas. So the question you have to answer is, was Judas a betrayer when Jesus chose him? Or did he become a betrayer after Jesus chose him? Which is it? I think it's the latter. I think he became a betrayer. Why do I believe that? Well, because of what the Scripture teaches. Let me read to you these passages. John 12, verse 4. It says, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said. Now, the tense of the verb here and in these next two passages I'm about to read to you, they are not the past tense. He already was a betrayer. These, the tense of the, these verbs are all showing that it is a process that is taking place. Who would betray him? Describing a process. And then you see the process. John 13, 2. It says, The supper being ended, the devil having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So why was Judas' heart even open to betraying him? Well, the scripture tells us one other little detail, and that was that Judas held the purse, and he was pilfering out of the purse. So he was stealing money. Now, what do you have to do in your heart to steal money like that and kind of keep it from everybody else? Oh, you've got to harden yourself. And it's a willful decision every single time he does it. And then, what else was going through his mind? The scripture doesn't tell us. But I'll bet you there was a whole bunch of other stuff going on inside his head. And we could speculate all day about that. But all I know is that this man was compromising his own faith compromising his own conscience, 
And that spells doom to anyone. Anyone. And so then in John 13, 27, it says, Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. So I believe that this was a process that this man went through. It was a process long after Jesus chose him and drew him and asked him to follow him. It was a process just like the process that was taking place with these disciples that are now turning around and walking no more with him. The process of these people, they heard the message, they thought to themselves, hey, this sounds really cool. I think I'm going to believe. I think I'm going to follow him. And hey, really good benefit. He, he gives free bread and free fish. Uh, and so their heart said, hey, this is a deal. This is a deal. I don't have to work anymore. I can just follow this guy and he's going to feed me and take care of me. And so their hearts began to change. And then when Jesus corrected them, they again they turned in their heart just a little bit more. When he really put it to them and said, this is what it means to follow me, they said, we're out of here. So just like the process they went through to reject him and become a rejecter of Christ, the same process takes place with Judas to ultimately betray him. Now, if you say, no, I think that he was a betrayer from the very beginning, and then that makes God out to be a really weird guy. Think about it. If that's true, then the, what the ultra-Calvinists teach is called double election. He elects certain people to go to hell, and he elects certain people to go to heaven. And there isn't anything you can do to change that. Is that true? It is not. That is not from the Scripture. And so a person that believes that Judas was a betrayer from the beginning and he had a heart that was unmoved, unchanged, unwilling, then you, you basically make God out to be a weird guy. But when Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come, then I believe that whoever or anyone, when Jesus makes those statements, he means whoever, and he means who or anyone. Anyone except Judas, anyone except these guys and these guys, and no. He makes the offer to Judas just like he makes to you and to me. And you have to make that decision to follow or to reject. And so this latter view is really reveals the incredible love of God, the incredible graciousness of God that would reach out to someone and give them the opportunity even though they know they are going to betray, even though they know they're going to go away. I mean, Jesus could have said, I know you, you and you, get out of here because I know you're not going to believe, so I'm not going to preach to you. Does he do that? No. Neither will you do that. Do you know who is going to receive and who is not going to receive? I don't know that. And so he wants me to preach the gospel to every creature, just like he did. Very important. So I, I leave you with this. Remember, God, he sees it all. He knows my heart. He, I can't hide anything from him. And so will you... Ask him in honesty, Lord, my, my heart is, I'm, I'm stumbled. I'm struggling. I am having a difficulty over this issue or that issue or this moral issue or this belief. I, I'm, I'm struggling. Just be honest with him and just say, Lord, I want you to resolve that issue. Help me to resolve it so that I can follow you fully. I can follow you with all my heart because that's what he's after. He wants you to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So let's go to him and ask him to do that. Father, we thank you so much 
that you are so ready, you are so willing to respond to us, Lord, to respond to our, our cry. Lord, you see it all. All you want us to be is honest with you. And so I'm, I'm encouraging any Christian here this morning, you are, you're stumbling. You've got that one moral issue, that one belief, that one issue where you just, you're, you're battling, you're struggling. Surrender it to him. Give it up and just say, Lord, conform me into your image. Conform me, transform me by your spirit. Change me. This is what you have come to do. Yield to him and ask his spirit to just fall upon you right now. <coughs> to set you free. To strengthen you. He can do it. Lord, I pray that you would just do that work inside of us. You're the only one who can. We thank you. You've bridged the gap. Lord, we can come in right into your presence and receive from you. Lord, fill with life. Turn us from every pursuit where we're trying to find life. We, we want to follow you and walk in your life. And if you're here this morning and you, you're not following him, you're not walking with him, will you respond to him this morning? We receive him. Maybe you've received him before, but you, you just haven't been following. You haven't been obeying him. You haven't seen that, that transformation in your life that you thought would happen. You need to surrender. You need to bow your knee to him. That's what it requires. Are you willing to do that? If you are, I, I want to pray with you right now. Say these words to him. Say them from your heart. Just say, God, I am I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I have failed. I have broken your law. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I surrender my entire life into your hands. Take it. I yield. If you just prayed that prayer, we acknowledge that you prayed with me here by by just lifting your hand here, a simple acknowledgement. I'd like to pray for you. Anyone here? Father, we give you praise for your great grace that changes us, that transforms us. We give you praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen.